from the Ronald Reagan Institute in Washington, D.C. This is Rendezvous with History, a podcast that captures the drama of presidential decision-making. Dr. Anthony Eames sits down with prominent scholars and leading citizens to bring to life what happens in the White House and how it shapes the world. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. Welcome back, Rendezvous with History listeners. I'm so pleased to be joined here today with Dr. James Graham Wilson, supervisory historian at the U.S. Department of State and author of the, I guess, soon to be best selling, since no one can get their hands on a copy anymore, America's Cold Warrior, Paul Nitza and National Security from Roosevelt to Reagan. James, thanks for coming on the podcast. Well, thank you so much, Anthony, and thank you to the Reagan Institute for having me. Um, I'm obliged to say at this moment that my views uh, are my own and do not necessarily uh, reflect those of the United States government or the State Department. Although well-considered views and hopefully the U.S. government uh, uh, takes such practice as well. Um, okay, so James, this, this book has been kind of in development for a number of years. It's good to see it's finally on the printed page, but uh, I think we all want to know, you know, where did this book come from? Why did you decide to start writing a book on, on Paul Nitz of all people? Well, uh, th thanks, Anthony. I know you yourself uh, had some interest and in, have, have some interest in him as well. And I was thinking, you know, there are multiple origins to this. And it occurred to me after I have inflicted one origin story uh, on you already in the past few weeks that I, I remember now that in working on my dissertation in about uh, from the years 2005 to uh, 2011, which was on Reagan and Gorbachev and, and the end of the Cold War, um, I, I did have a significant interest in Paul Nitze in the context of his involvement in the Reykjavik encounter in uh, October of 1986, uh, where he led an all-night session uh, with the Soviet counterpart marshal, um, Sergei, Sergei Akramayev. And there was a moment at one point where Akramayev referred to himself as the last of the Mohicans. And the context was that he was the last um, kind of uh, Soviet uh, general officer, army officer, uh, who was still around from, from World War II. And then he made a joke saying, like that great author, James Fenimore Kuperski, <laughs> And the Americans all thought this was, you know, kind of funny. It's a rare, you know, moment of levity for a, a Soviet negotiator. And I remember thinking to myself, this was many years ago, that in, in many respects, Paul Nitze fit that bill as well, and that he had been really involved in the Cold War policies uh, and, and World War II policies as well. And so that that was a kind of, you know, something of great interest to me at the time. And as I think you know, have experienced, Anthony, and uh, many of the listeners, watchers of this podcast, you kind of find nuggets like that, and they strike an interest to you. But then you have to, you have to move on to the to what you're working on uh, at at the moment. Uh, but they kind of come back to you in in phases. And so, you know, a few years later, the kind of the main moment of crystallization for me, uh, the story I think I've I've told you before. The main moment was I was at a um, Wilson Center event with uh, the wonderful historian Frank Castigliola uh, back in, I think, 2014 or so. And he, at the time, was editing or had edited the uh, George Kennan Diaries and then went on to write uh, a really wonderful book about uh, Kennan and Russia and Kennan focusing on his time sort of after uh, Mr. X and the long telegram etc. But I remember being in the audience for that, and each time he would get to Kennan's views of what the U.S. government should be doing, whether it was in Vietnam or in the 1980s with, in the context of the INF missile deployment, I kept thinking to myself, well, yeah, he's saying that, but I don't, or he's thinking that, and he's writing that, but, you know, who in power, who in Washington, in the White House, in the State Department is actually kind of taking those ideas seriously, who, who is engaging and acting or not acting based on them. And at each moment, I thought, well, you know, there is somebody who is actually involved in the room and is working on these debates uh, and is trying to craft a grand bargain with, with the Soviets. And that person is Paul Nitze. Um, these 
two individuals had been paired in um, a really good book by Nicholas Thompson called The Hawk and the Dove. Um, but I think there was more to the story. And, you know, again, in the theme of how do you get into this project? Well, I went to dinner afterwards with, with Frank and uh, Sarah Snyder and a couple, and I think it was the two of them. And we kind of talked through this and, you know, in a real spirit of collegiality and cordiality, you know, Frank said, well, you should pursue this, you know, if that's what you think, you keep, you dig into the project. And I did. It took me a long time. Uh, it took about 10 years. And I had some other really encouraging folks along the way. Uh, David Milne, in his wonderful book, World Making, uh, The Art and Science of U.S. Diplomacy, has, I think, a really persuasive chapter about Paul Nitze and he, in his um, paradigm of artists and science, scientists uh, identifies Paul Nitz as a scientist. And I think that that's correct. I think that, you know, when I remember reading that, I thought still there was sort of not as much about the later period, that is the 70s and 80s, um, the 80s when he's becomes basically the arms control czar to Secretary of State George Schultz. Um, and then I had, you know, some other other folks who really encouraged me to do it. It, I think, took it took March to, to March of 2020 um, when we all were kind of put on lockdown with COVID. And around that time, I remember reading um, there's a, a listserv that I think we're both on called H Diplo um, that periodically has um, scholars, senior scholars, write um, reflections on their own careers and their own kind of life histories and why they're interested in, in such topics. And it was around the time of March, 2020 that um, John Lewis Gaddis wrote his um, and, you know, Gaddis had kind of uh, his work on Kennan had hovered. It was an excuse I had in my head. I said, well, you know, there's this giant book on, on Kennan that took 25 years, won the Pulitzer prize and et cetera. You know, how can I, write something to compare with that. But I remember reading that and I thought, wow, this is just, it's a reminder that what we are, what our craft is, is to think and write. And that's just what we have to pursue. If we have an idea, something that animates, that motivates you, it's important to follow through on it. And it doesn't really matter, you know, whether it's going to stack up to something that wins the Pulitzer Prize. You just have to follow through, you know, for yourself and so, you know, at the time uh, we were expecting our first child and there were a lot of long nights in the kind of years that followed. And that I, you know, I had a couple draft chapters, but, you know, holding a newborn, you know, for long nights, your mind wanders. Right. And I think that was it was a great blessing for me to have some of the questions that I was grappling with in the book to kind of stick in my head to, to, to think about, because at least you can kind of, you can control how you yourself, um, how you come up with answers to particular questions, how, if you're thinking through a particular chapter, um, how are you going to structure it? How are you going to kind of, um, how are you going to line up the evidence and figure out, you know, which questions you have to answer are more important than others. So, and it was all, it was in a sense, history is therapy, writing history is as therapy. Um, and so I've been just, you know, just very fortunate to, to be able to, to see this sitting right here. <laughs> yeah. Well, James, uh, you know, one, we expect that this, uh, appearance on our podcast will put you over the, the finish line for, for the Pulitzer, but, uh, <laughs> it, it is kind of funny that you and I both share this, um, this odd connection of, of the pandemic and holding a newborn in sleepless nights, allowing us to think through how to finish a book and, and organize the book and whatnot. So I, I guess that's good advice for, for prospective authors is, is have a newborn and then you'll get over the hill. Um, you know, you mentioned you think of Paul Nitza as a scientist or that struck a chord with you. Uh, I always suppose I've thought of him more of as an economist um, but this early generation of national security professionals, as you point out, needed generalists. And there's something very specific about 
Paul Nitz's upbringing, his early life, his his burgeoning career that that kind of positions him to play the role of generalist and dabble as a scientist or an economist or as a historian. Uh, can you give me a little you know sense of, of of that early life of that remarkable period that you know brought him into to maturity? Well, there's a whole opportunity for a kind of Freudian analysis of of Paul Nitze. And uh, that's not what this book is, but I'll just say very, you know, very briefly that his, he grew up, um, he grew up in Chicago where his father taught at the University of Chicago and was a renowned philologist, a specialist in, um, in Romance languages. And I opened the book by describing how he and his parents and his sister um, were hiking uh, in the Alps in the summer of 1914 on vacation. And they would always, father was a, um, both parents were German heritage. They would always go back to Europe uh, in the summers. So they're hiking in the Alps and they go up the mountain and, you know, there's a very rustic scene there, given uh, milk from the cow. Um, it's, you know, just sort of an old world experience. And, and they come down the mountain and, it's the same family, and the the wife, the mother, is is crying because the father, the husband, has just been conscripted into the Austrian um, Austro-Hungarian Empire because World War Two, World War One, is about to uh, break out, and so I bookend that with then um, uh, Paul Nitze, uh preparing to meet uh, Condoleezza Rice as National Security Advisor. Um, on the day that winds up being September 11th, they're supposed to, she's supposed to give a speech at SAIS, which is obviously canceled. But back back to his early upbringing, you know, he certainly that that experience of being in Europe uh, that summer of 1914, and they didn't go immediately back. Um, I think it was. I'm trying. I, I think I have this straight in the book. Hopefully that they. They they spend some time in Germany in the weeks after, and I think it was it was difficult for them to get back. Like just logistically, they were having trouble. And so, but he's there and has the memory of the kind of um, excitement of the crowd of in Germany, the soldiers parading through the streets, and it was a obviously a very for any you know any seven or eight year old boy a kind of memorable thing to see. Um. And he comes back home, he grows up, he goes, he's in high school at this, the prestigious University of Chicago lab school. And he writes frequently in reflection um, about how when he's in high school, he's involved in an exercise, a class exercise, where you're supposed to um, kind of take the role of the negotiators in Paris in 1919 and he he loves this experience. I mean, he just it really is memorable to him. And so is his contrast between the you know actual mock playing the statesman in Paris, and and hearing and observing his father and his father's friends, the most kind of talented minds of their generation uh, at the University of Chicago, uh, their inputs into kind of world affairs. And from his perspective, they're basically, uh, whether you're in doing the mock uh, peace convention in high school or you're summering at a nice lake and hearing these professors talk about it, it has the same impact. Um, so he's a kind of rebellious, rebellious kid who has a lot of, a lot of chutzpah and, and he goes on to... Um, attend a prestigious preparatory school uh, and then to Harvard and uh, where he does not really excel academically. Um, but I think that all of that time he, he sees himself wanting to be what he calls a man of action, not just somebody who talks about things who, you know, has big debates and doesn't, cause any actual effect. And there's a couple moments, a couple of years later where 
he goes to interview, um, he, he's interviewing around, around New York City. And at one of the bank houses, um, he observes Clarence Dillon basically picking up the phone, telling people to do this, this, that, or the, the other thing. And that for him, the experience of Clarence Dillon was, oh, I think was a real formidable, uh, formidable <laughs> individual and the father of Doug Dillon, later uh, treasury secretary. But that kind of really touched a nerve in him that that was he, here, here is how, you know, things happen in the world. It's somebody like this, um, somebody in a position of power who picks up the phone and they kind of make a decision. And I think that he wanted, he was attracted to that. He wanted to be around people like that, not necessarily because, you know, he wanted to kind of be a powerful person. He, I think, well, to some extent he wanted, you know, he wanted to make things happen, but he also wanted to be around people like that. And to the extent that he was a scientist, he believed firmly that for any particular problem, whether it was business or later in, in government, that, you know, what you, what you needed to do was you needed to apply a logic chain, just apply logic to it. And you could, by in so doing, figure out the solution. And that, I think, distinguishes him from, you know, you could say an artist, an artist is kind of put forward or, or a politician, right? I mean, a politician tries to kind of create a constituency, tries to persuade you, um, sometimes through, you know, dishonesty or, or exaggeration. Uh, and Nitzer didn't like that. He just said, well, that's not how you, you solve problems. You just apply logic to it. Um, and that, that helped him. Sometimes it didn't help him. Yeah, I, I want to draw this out because, you know, you, you draw a pretty clear contrast between Nitz's strengths um, and then his weaknesses in comparison to kind of those other members of his cohort, people like Henry Kissinger, or Kissinger uh, people like uh, this big new Brzezinski, and uh, we have already mentioned Kennan. Uh, there's certainly a, a kind of a, an early generation of national security professionals that go to, to contribute to this template. And um, how would you compare, in a more broad sense, it's a standing and in, in, in qualities within that group to, to some of those other people I mentioned? Well, it's a very important um, point in terms of what I'm trying to wrestle with in the book. Uh, the there there has been, of course, the Kennan and Nitsa dual biography, and uh, I don't try to replicate that here. Although an important sub theme is that I think that 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 Nitsa is ultimately more important than Kennan in in the Cold War, and. Let me just contrast them a little bit. Um, so in 1946, um, uh, at the start of 1946, uh, Paul Nitze had uh, just been finishing up his work on the Strategic Bombing Survey Part 2 in Japan. Uh, he had, in, in the first iteration of it in, uh, in Europe, he was focused more narrowly on um, how do you kind of take the evidence of the impact of U.S. and allied, U.S. and British um, strategic bombing of German uh, cities, industry, etc. How do you kind of take the evidence and um, make the bombing more lethal, more effective in um, crushing the German economy? It's a kind of grim you know, project to work on. Um, but he did, and he, he savored that. And then when he went to do a similar thing in Japan, it was after um, Japan had surrendered. So it was, there was kind of, it was a less pressing to come up with immediate results. And he got uh, a bit more latitude personally from President uh, Harry Truman, uh, who said, you know, while you're at it, talking to, talking to uh, now kind of, I guess in semi-custody uh, Japanese leaders, uh, talking to them and examining the evidence, try to figure out why they attacked us in the first place. And, you know, Nitzik really took that and ran with it. And he, who had never really, he had never served in, in combat and had no 
real formal training in, I guess, what you would call national security affairs, um, he, he really excelled. And partly it was his confidence, his confidence he, from his time on Wall Street in the 1930s was very comfortable arguing, dealing with very powerful, uh, well, self-powerful uh, individuals. Uh, but there was also the sense that by the fall of 1945, a, a lot of people were moving on to other post-war activities. And he, he, stays and he stays in Japan, and he really goes to work on this project. It's a long-winded way of getting to Kennan, right? But it, in early 1946, as he's working on the preface to the Strategic Bombing Survey um, for Japan, he inserts some language that I think is pretty clearly saying that Japan attacked us at Pearl Harbor because it was so ev- so obvious that the U.S. had let down its defenses. Um, it had failed to kind of um, negotiate from a position of strength. And I, what I think is very that that is abundantly clear from what he what he writes. But what I think is also on his mind is that he's looking around the world, um, particularly at the Soviet Union in early 1946, and the fact that that they have not um, demobilized, and whereas the United States is quickly demobilizing, and that what we needed to do was basically um, not have any illusions of what that meant, and we were not ineluctably heading toward, toward a peacetime order. He was roundly rejected that, I mean, that, that, that line, which he tried to give to, to Dean Acheson, Dean Acheson says, you're, you're seeing ghosts, right? And so he's all the more frustrated when, um, you know, uh, George Kennan, following Stalin's so-called election speech, writes his long telegram, which has tremendous resonance uh, around D.C. And I think that it's very important to, to consider how how Kennan was such a better writer and, you know, he was able to kind of really masterfully frame, frame this in a way that people around DC responded to whether or not they took immediate action. Um, I think that the kind of that paradigm holds true through the rest of, of their careers that Kennan is this beautiful writer. Um, Nitsa does not have that, Faculty, but at the same time, after 1950, you know, Kennan kind of goes back to his, goes back to Princeton in a in a funk, and whereas Nitza, who had been passed over to be Kennan's deputy previously, and then from 1950 onward would repeatedly about ten times, kind of not be given the job that he wanted, he would lose debates. Um, but he stuck in the game. You know, he stayed in a position, he managed to craft out a, a, a career in a position uh, where he could command White House attention, even if he was not in a particular administration. I do want to get to this point about um, the ways in which Nitsa sought to, to influence. Um, you know, as you point out, bold analysis, relatively poor communication, not just, not just in, in terms of the written sense, but also orally in a, in, in a sense. Uh, we'll get to the presidents because clearly yeah. he had I- an influence on presidents and uh, from, from Roosevelt to Reagan as your, as your book title states, but there's also the school of advanced international studies, another way in which he seeks to influence all, be it a rising generation of national security policy professionals. Um, you know, what was the need that he was trying to fill? What was the vision that he had for, 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 for size and, and, you know, what were the kind of insecurities that he was grappling with as he got into that project with his, with his brother-in-law? Well, let's, um, so the, just the, on the, that very last point, so the, the size is with um, Christian Herter, who there's a, there's a, um, it's related by cousin, I forget, I think it's the wives, the wives or cousins, the brother, the brother-in-law, He's very fortunate to have a brother-in-law, who, Walter Pepke, who's uh, uh, a pioneering businessman, and they mutually invest in what becomes Aspen. So that's he benefits from that relationship too. That um, okay. Let, let me just back up a little bit. In, in terms of the insecurities, 
the in, in, his relationship to academia is important, and his kind of sense of insecurity about it, I think, is also important. In the mid 1930s, he gets bored with Wall Street for a year or two, and he goes back to Harvard to pursue a PhD in sociology, and you know that lasts two semesters. So he's a he's a perpetual ABD after that, I guess. <laughs> um, I think that he also finds that when he's in the State Department and in other positions in World War II, he he's unimpressed by the kind of professionalism, um, and he's also uh, aggrieved by the high degree of um, kind of political fiefdoms. Um, even though the, you know there was a wide, uh, I'll just use an example when he was working on um, obtaining strategic critical minerals uh, for the wartime effort, uh, he hires a lot of um, people who identify as Republicans. A lot of geologists. I don't, for whatever reason, geologists were in the nineteen early nineteen forties. Republicans. I have no idea. There's um, a study for you. Study, yeah, there's a study for someone. But you know, the, what 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 irked him, you know, is, is he, he's, he he said, well, these are the best people for the job. Like his approach was, I I talked to somebody, I talked to, you know, a professor at Harvard, and he says, go get these ten people, and that's what he did, and he valued the expertise. He he didn't like to have to kind of you know, justify that. I'm going to hire people from a different party that's not in power. He thought that's ridiculous. You know, he, he just was very dubious of political partisanship writ large. And then he also encountered, you know, some shenanigans um, uh, by people who were angling to ultimately succeed FDR at some point. You know, he, he just didn't, he, he was not a political, somebody who wanted, who, who thought, he thought it was beneath him to have to deal with the levers of political maneuvering um, so that and, and the sense that, you know, the State Department, you know, was not really um, he, his experience, the A-team. So a after World War II, and the chronology is a little, it's a little weird because he, 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 he helped co-found SICE with Christian Herter, um, I think in the late 40s, but Herter basically runs it and then they they swap uh, during the Eisenhower administration, when when it comes out of out of the Eisenhower administration, and he spends the the, the mid nineteen fifties there. Um, but the one of the things they tried to do originally was not necessarily train um, train Americans to go into government. It was to kind of have uh, corporations send for a year or two their up-and-comers mm -hmm. to SICE, and they would be trained in how to kind of ne deal, negotiate with the world um, at the level of being a diplomat, but not necessarily in government. And what they quickly found is that, you know, whether it was IBM or whatever, or General Electric, they, they didn't want to send, <laughs> they didn't want to send their best for a year or two. They wanted their best to go out to the field and you know, uh, make money for the firm. So they had to kind of modulate the mission a little bit. And it, it then kind of evolved into, we need to train the kind of uh, an elite cadre who can, um, and, you know, not all of them do go into government, but we, we need to kind of focus on the practical experience of, that combines academia as well as um, policymaking. And in the 1950s, I mean, his great coup uh, in terms of hiring is he gets Hans Morgenthau um, to come from the University of Chicago, which he obviously must have savored with his own father's uh, relationship with, with, with the University of Chicago. Hans Morgenthau is this sort of great realist thinker, but they don't get along. You know, Nitz's, and I, I'm sure the personalities maybe didn't, didn't click, uh, but I think it, it was definitely true what Nitzer wrote, which is that he just, he was quite convinced that, you know, you can you can write about these theoretical things on the outside, but you don't really understand how the world works if you haven't spent some time in government. Um, and there's you know it, it's so he, he's always trying to kind of strike a balance between um, uh, thinking about something, reading about foreign policy in the abstract, coming up with theories, and he's always trying to come up with this grand theory, which he never really succeeds at. 
uh, he's, but he's wrestling with that and then the kind of practical experience of, of serving in these, these mid-level positions. Well, okay, mid-level positions. Um, it's shocking the degree of influence that Nitsa has, despite never really reaching the pinnacle or getting the top job. He's never SecDef, he's never Secretary of State, he's never the National Security Advisor. Um, you know, what keeps him from ascending to that to that highest peak. Well, the the, the last one is the easiest one. He, um, the National Security Advisor, uh, JFK, offers it to him in the beginning of 1961, and he turns it down because he, he thinks it's not an important job. Uh, a career mistake, I guess, as you would say. I, I don't. To your point, you know, maybe not an important job then, but someone later comes on and makes it important. Yeah, it it became important. Uh, you know, he he expected, I think. He felt entitled to the position of Secretary of Defense in the summer of 1976 when he met with uh, that candidate, Jimmy Carter, in, in Georgia. And the meeting went, went very poorly. Uh, he basically torpedoed his own chances of, of that. Um, but it gets to your earlier point that, and I'll just to take a minute to contrast him with, with Henry Kissinger, who obviously is I, the most famous statesman, U.S. statesman in the 20th century, if, you know, at least. Um, so in the 1950s, let me just say about their own frenemyship, um, Henry Kissinger comes along, and he, as with Nitsa, I would say, is a generalist, but he does everything Nitsa did a little better, right? He's a, he writes beautifully, has a great sense of humor, and... Uh, he writes a book about, and they're both critical of Dwight Eisenhower's nuclear policies and their emphasis on massive retaliation. Kissinger writes a book called Nuclear Weapons and World Affairs, and Nitsa steps out to review it, and he submits the draft review, um, and then he gets a letter basically saying that Henry Kissinger has threatened to sue him for libel. Um, and he's sort of unexpected, you know, this is, wasn't expecting that. He tones down the review a little bit. And the next time he encounters Kissinger in person, I mean, Kissinger says, I won't do the accent, but it was sort of, you know, he, he says, well, you know, part of the deal was that they were going to let me write a, like a long as possible response. And I got to page 156. And I decided, you know, I'm just going to relent. And anyone who's ever heard Kissinger speak, you can kind of, you can imagine how disarming that, that moment was, uh, that he could kind of take this very awkward encounter and just, you know, spin it a certain way. And I don't think Nitsu was capable of that. And he certainly wasn't, he didn't, you know, you can also hear the way that Nixon and, and Kissinger interact with each other on, on the White House tapes. And that all would have horrified Nitsa. I mean, Nitsa was not somebody who was going to kiss up to power. Um, and to give a specific example, when he's brought in to observe um, President Lyndon Johnson, I think it was when I it may have I think it was when Nitsa's deputy secretary of defense, so like 1967 or so, um, Johnson has him sit across uh, sort of across the Oval Office. And he just ignores him. He goes about taking calls for like an hour or two. And every once in a while, he glances over and looks at Nitsa to see how he responds to him. And this is a very bizarre kind of power. I don't know. I don't, very Johnson power. Very Johnson. Yeah. And Nitsa said, I don't want any part of that. I'm not going to be somebody who, you know, who, who participates in this game. But the thing is, there are other people who did. Other people who are willing willing to do that and, and get to the get to the highest ranks. But it, just just a quick point, because I, I, I sense you want to move on, but I, the quick point, how did he, was there something positive that he did that kind of allowed him to stick in this game? And there I would say that he, going back to the point of academia as well, that that's being there at the dawn of the nuclear age really set him up for success in the sense that he knew 
as much about nuclear weapons and their potential effects on world affairs as anyone else in the world. And nobody who kind of, you know, Tom Schelling is a beautiful writer, tremendous mind, but there was nothing that he wrote that was ever as kind of um, as helpful to a President Kennedy dealing with Berlin or the Cuban Missile Crisis. Nothing was quite as helpful as having somebody who had the kind of experience of being in, in prior administrations. And you see that point with when he gets called back in by John Foster Dulles, who they never really liked each other. But when Dulles is Secretary of State, he actually has only a few people with the clearances and with the experiences and their, the proximity of D.C. that he can call in and kind of use as a sounding board. Um, and that really propels Nitz's career for the rest of, of his life. You mentioned Kennedy. Um, yeah. Uh, there's some situations in Cuba that are worth talking about in terms of those powerful events that shape Nitz's continued thinking. Of course, by, by the time the 1960s rolls around, he's already a matured national security professional, or he's reached a certain stage of influence. Uh, and yet the experience with the community missile crisis and the Bay of Pigs seems to... to to refine his outlook moving forward. Can you tell me a little bit about, about his time with the Kennedy administration and how, how the events in Cuba shaped his thinking. The, the, um, you can find it in the Foreign Relations volume leading up to Bay of Pigs in, nine, in 61, where Kennedy sort of goes around the room and is asking people to weigh in on uh, – that fiasco that's about to happen. And, you know, there's nothing noble about Nitz's response. He just says, okay, this, whatever. Um, so he's, he's certainly not kind of, I, I think he was skeptical about it, but he didn't have the guts to, to stick up um, in advance of Bay of Pigs. When it comes to the Cuban Missile Crisis, I'm, I'm, try, I'm thinking through the way you just phrased it with, we're fine. I, I, or perhaps I, it's, it's it's possible for the right word. I mean, it, it narrows. I, I try to say in the book that the kind of the focus, his narrow is focus. His focus, I'm sorry, his focus is narrowed after Cuban the Cuban Missile Crisis, and he then well he spends two years as um, Secretary of the Navy, but but the the his focus then is narrowed to exclusively nuclear matters. And I think a lot of it has to do with his interpretation of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which differs from, from Robert McNamara. Nitsa is not, not impressed by Kennedy in the Cuban Missile Crisis. He's and not it, impressed. By he, is not, he is not impressed by Kennedy's performance. He, he, I should have said earlier, in terms of national security advisor, it, it wouldn't have worked. They, didn't, they were not really hand in glove, uh, Nitsa and the Kennedy administration. And, you know, if you listen to the tapes of the Cuban Missile Crisis, Kennedy, whatever you think of Kennedy and his performance, he's unbelievably polite in this <laughs> stressful moment, right? The only person he's ever really rude to is Paul Nitsa. Uh, and it has to do with the Jupiters and, 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 and Turkey. Nitsa uh, has a knack for making people uh, bring out their rude side, is what I'm... Uh, yeah, sometimes, sometimes. Um, but I... So he's not impressed. He he feels that that the situation got better when when Dean Acheson kind of uh, appeared on the scene and and finally was a bit more. This led to decisive action. But the broader point is that Nitsa believes that the Soviets backed down because of overwhelming U.S. conventional and nuclear superiority even though the trend lines, he thought, were going in the wrong direction. And then what happens after that is that the Soviets build up to match and some categories surpass the United States. But the interpretation that at least Nitsa thinks that McNamara takes, and I, I think it's roughly accurate, was that both sides had gone to the brink and they realized, they sort of saw the abyss over... Uh, over the cliff, and they're like, well, this is never going to happen again. And that in part leads McNamara to cap the U.S. Minuteman fleet at roughly a 1,000. And Nitsa just thought this was a terrible idea, that that wasn't the lesson to take from the Cuban Missile Crisis at all. 
And as I try to, the point I try to develop in the book afterwards is that when he starts talking about something called the Nitza scenario in, in the late 19 or the mid 1970s, it has to do with the Soviets unveiling a new type of missile. What was the, then the SS-9, then became the SS-18, that was so much bigger than anything that was needed to kind of maintain a sense of uh, uh, mutual assured destruction that, again, by Nitz's logic chain, if you keep, keep going down the different chains, you know, the only reason they have it is to take out the U.S. land-based nuclear deterrent. And why would they do that? Well, they would do that because it would spare American cities. And Nitsa believed that the Soviets knew, Soviet leaders knew what Nitsa was sure of, which is that in that situation, no American president would strike back if they were given the, the ultimatum. Okay, we've taken out your land-based nukes. We've spared your cities. You have an option. You know, you can attack our cities or you can surrender. And I think Nitsa was the view that American, the American people, it was just, there was an asymmetry in terms of what you would t tolerate. And the American people uh, elected presidents, none of whom would kind of do anything except, except surrender. Now, that's of all a very hypothetical thing that fortunately has never happened. But I think that he, he took from that scenario in, in the mid-70s that the, the Soviet leaders were confident in their own understanding of this scenario. And if you ever had a repetition of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which thankfully we didn't, if, but if you ever had a repetition, a repetition of it, they, they would never back down as they had in October of 1962. And their confidence in that would encourage them to take more, take on more risk and more potential probing and aggressive actions in Latin America and Africa and, and Southeast Asia. So he, he became really quite quite obsessed with that, I would say. I mean, I'm a little obsessed with his obsession, but I, I do think that, that that all came out of his interpretation of, of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Well, this is a, a, a kind of a great segue into really the crowning, you know, achievements and era of his career, yeah. which is um, his service in the Reagan presidency and particularly his you know, kind of execution of the vision of peace through strength that was central to, to the Reagan revolution. Um, also, interestingly enough, you know, Nitsa is a, is a registered Democrat, as you, as you mentioned in the book, and yet, you know, he plays such a large role in what is con conceived of at the time to be largely a conservative national security kind of platform. Um, so bring us back to the 1980s, you know, you were, we were just in the 1960s and he learns this lesson of basically, you know, we can, we cannot continue to be weak and vulnerable if the Soviets continue to build up, you know, we can only expect more adventurism, um, more pressing of the advantage. Uh, so, so bring us back into the 1980s then and how that, that kind of set that lesson from Cuba, um, shapes his approach to dealing with his opposite numbers uh, in the Soviet Union to reach a limitation on theater nuclear forces and, and strategic nuclear forces. Let me, let me lead into that question a little bit, um, it, just going from the 70s in, into there. As um, I think many listeners may know who have worked on this project, um, NHTSA was involved in something called the Pre Committee on the Present Danger um, in the 1970s, which I think was kind of roughly evenly split between Democrats and Republicans who, who served on it and were dissatisfied with, with Jimmy Carter's approach. They were dissatisfied with, you know, before that with, with, with Nixon and Ford and, and detente and the kind of, you know, Reagan is involved in some, some degree, but I think the kind of uh, convergence of Nitsa and, and Reagan has to do with the declassification of NSC 68 in 1975, um, and then its inclusion in the Foreign Relations volume that came out in 1976. So as many listeners may also know, uh, 
Reagan uh, during that period after he lose he well, comes very close to you know winning the seventy six Republican nomination, uh, but after that his his radio speeches I think are very influential in terms of propelling him toward the the Republican nomination of nineteen eighty, and he gives several speeches that are really just devoted to NSC sixty eight, um, and I think for him. There was a sense that, you know, he had voted for Harry Truman. Uh, he considered himself to be, um, in some sense, a disaffected Democrat, but also, you know, a conservative. Um, but he, he certainly wanted to appeal to the kind of first principles, first Truman Democrats who believe that we had gotten away from first principles of the U.S. and the world. And I think that he really, I mean, he respected Paul Nitze. And Paul Nitze, not really in court, not in coordination with Reagan, and was really out to get uh, the Salt II tr uh, Treaty from being ratified. And so there's a kind of convergence, but not coordinated, a convergence between the two. I don't, I don't know. I can't remember. Uh, it could be in the book whether Nitze formally endorsed Reagan. I don't. I don't think he. Did. I don't think he did. But the, the, the bridge between the two was Eugene Rostow, who comes in as the director of arms control and disarmament in, in 81. He advocates for bringing Nitza on to be the INF negotiator. And Nitza certainly wasn't, he was not a, I guess the term would be reagan -aught. He was very vocal and he goes on um, Bill Buckley's firing line to talk about how he just didn't believe in, you know, lowering taxes. He thought we should be raising taxes to uh, increase defense. And I, I don't think, you know, in, in terms of the kind of the cons American conservatism at home, I, I think in general, I mean, Paul Nitzer really, he, he didn't weigh in a lot on domestic politics. Um, he, he just was focused very exclusively on the strategic balance and how to craft a kind of arms control arms agreement that would lead to reductions in destabilizing missiles. And that was exactly what, what Reagan wanted. And, you know, to the, to the, you know, again, a confluence of interest, the Reagan administration was sort of like, let's get the best people. And, you know, they didn't care that he was, he hadn't endorsed him and, you know, was skeptical about the economic policies. Um, they bring him on. And then as I think some people know about his so-called walk in the woods in uh, 19, uh, goodness, uh, summer of 1982, which I try to say in the book, you know, it's not quite, it's not quite as cut and dry as I think it, it came out. So it, just to refresh people's memory, he, Paul Nitz is in Geneva in the summer of 1982, and there's a moment where he invites his Soviet counterpart, or they invite each other, like, uh, and they, they go into the woods uh, nearby at a lovely bucolic location. And, you know, they kind of sit together and it has sketched out um, a potential compromise for an agreement that would obviate the need for the full scale U.S. and NATO deployment of INF missiles for a kind of phased reduction in the Soviet uh, SS-20 um, missiles. And this was kind of heresy in terms of the uh, stated position of the Reagan administration, which was we should accept nothing less than zero. Uh, Paul Nista was very concerned that, you know, the more the Reagan administration held on to the position of zero, zero, that, you know, you would, it would increase the likelihood of a real rift within NATO because there was just such immense pressure um, in Germany and elsewhere to get some kind of some kind of agreement and the sense that the Reagan administration was, you know, didn't care about an agreement, which I don't think was, I don't think was accurate, but you know, that was the kind of political reality you were dealing with. And what happens when Nitsa kind of reports back on all this is that there's not, he doesn't get fired uh, and he doesn't get outright smacked down. I, I think that the administration kind of considers it, and I think in some instances, in the next six to nine months, they they kind of entertain some interim agreements. It certainly that, becomes a 
uh, an instance that they play to European governments that they're yeah. that they're working sincerely toward some negotiated settlement. It's I mean it's a really mm-hmm. difficult and fascinating problem. You know that's that I think uh, you know many people have um, uh, Susie Colburn and uh, others have have written you know great books. Um, uh, um, I. I think so. Two things happen, right? One, one is in January of 1983 when some of this gets public. Eugene Rostow is is fired. Um, he had, or he steps down. He had, you know, I think irked some people in the administration on other matters. And uh, but Nitsa Nitsa stays on. Reagan has no, you know, says I'm not going to get rid of him. And then the more sort of the more important things that the the Soviets themselves. <laughs> You know, don't cooperate. They're, I mean, they're the ones who are the most obstinate here, and and so you have, you have the deployment, but then you, that's not still not not the big role that that NHTSA plays. I mean, I think to your point earlier that one of the more provocative things I try to say in the book is that I think even more important than his work on the, or, the beginning of the Cold War, uh, such as NSC sixty eight, is his role in sort of eighty five, eighty six onward, coming up with. Uh, what was called the, the, a strategic concept for integrating uh, Reagan's objective for the strategic defense initiative uh, and getting a real kind of uh, a large scale bargain on strategic offensive arms. And I think that that, that NHTSA really put forward a three phase approach um, that he puts on the table in December of 1984. And that sort of becomes the position of, of the U S government and to the point where you have in December of 1987, when you signed the INF agreement, uh, Reagan and Gorbachev at the White House, you know what what is kind of less lesser known, I think, is that down the street at the State Department, you you are like you get to a rough agreement that's 90 percent of the way uh, to a start agreement, and then the other 10 percent takes like four or five years. Um, but just to give an example, I mean, t- today is July 24th, um, July 25th tomorrow. In July 25th, 1986, Reagan sends a letter to Gorbachev, and this is in our, our foreign relations volume. Reagan sends a letter laying out this three-phased approach that I think I would argue kind of forms the basis of of it kind of establishes the parameters of what they what they talk about it in, in Reykjavik a couple months later. But I think that what this is a great achievement uh, in working with Schultz and working with Reagan was to kind of mesh these competing priorities of wanting to have moving to a world with strategic based on strategic defenses uh not offenses well we're coming up on a on an hour here and i like to get to a point where we discuss a little um say hints for history right um the 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 source or the you know the resource the hidden gem uh that you think needs to be examined a little bit more that could be tapped further for other historians or or scholars who are working on a book um, of their own, or contemplating a, a, the next project. What what in your research? And you don't have to tell us about your you know your next book. Maybe you want to keep that for yourself at this point. But uh, you know what in your research did you think uh, was right for further examination? Well, that's a important broad question. Um, so I'll say a couple of things. The first one is that part of the framework of this book is using the national security policy volumes in the foreign relations of the U.S. series that are all available at history.state.gov. Um, and when I was writing it, it was the ones that, that went up through the Ford administration, so up to 1976. And, you know, there's there's various ways of getting at that you can use uh, date and keyword combination searches to kind of choose your own adventure so to speak and you can also bring in you know other portions of the series i the example i always love to give is if you plug in the 13 days of the cube missile crisis you can now you know using the website you can see everything else that happened right and i feel i just feel like there's a book right. somebody Every, needs to write everything you know, else that happened everything else that happened in the world and a lot of things did happen i mean a war between china and india for, for instance um so i mean using i think using fruce to re-examine one's ex, you know inherited assumptions about this period and especially about the, the strategic nuclear balance in the 60s and 70s i i think is a is a gold mine and 
I, I just encourage people to do it. Um, in terms of, and, and uh, you know, I, national security strategy, this is, this is in a sense, or national security, it's, it's NHTSA's view of national security. Sometimes it's my view of national security. What we call national security in the first volumes is, you know, that's its own defined thing. And so it's not like the definition that everyone has to have. Um, so I, I just, I think there's, there's just multiple avenues to explore it. Um, the second thing is that the, the NHTSA papers at the Library of Congress are really extraordinary. And the Library of Congress is a wonderful place um, as a whole, just a, a number of, of gold mines within it. But for me, one of the big things was finding the transcriptions of the interviews that he did in working on his own memoir throughout the 1980s because he's while he's working in the reagan administration he has a little bit more time in the sense that he's not in charge of a bureau um so when he does have time he he is working with steve reardon and ann smith on this memoir that takes seven or eight years and i find that the transcripts of those conversations are just are just incredible and there's a lot more sort of color about some personal relationships and sometimes about uh things happening at that time in, in the eighties that I just found fascinating. So I think if anyone's interested and it doesn't have to be NHTSA, but it, you know, can people who are of that generation or surrounding him can really find a lot in his library of Congress uh, papers in terms of what I think about as a next project. Let me pick your, brain. Or, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Let yeah. me pick your brain uh, on, on these resources. Cause you've been doing something that's kind of fun and interesting with chat GPT. <laughs> and AI, uh, and ask Paul Nitza or ask George Schultz or ask Ronald Reagan. Tell me about uh, about this uh, little method you've developed. Well, I mean, this is partially just a parlor game, um, but with some kind of some serious interest in terms of you know, you know, you and I are doc. We we like documents, right? And and to what extent can you? use a set of documents or use a set of writings and digitize them to kind of fuel some of these chat GPT models. So you can now kind of interact with, with the people you study. And there's a kind of baser uh, motivation for it, which is that I think you and I've, we, we've trying to sometimes remember a quotation that we've seen and can't find it. And so it's sort of like, well, can I, can I set it up so it'll tell me the page number of something that I know I've read at some point? Um, but I, I do think that there's a more kind of, the exciting thing about some of the AI technology is that I think it can allow, allow us to focus more as, as writers on, on thinking through hard questions as opposed to kind of sometimes the busy work of, of trying to organize all, all these all these documents if you could I, I i don't i don't think it's you know i think some people might say well that's kind of cheating or skirting around things but you know it's i would say the the rejoinder to that would be like all right you know 20 years ago everybody was you know mocking wikipedia uh but like sometimes when you have to find a date of a battle or something it's like <laughs> i mean what, what else are you going to do to to yeah. you know find a find the date of something um, but yeah, I, I have a chat. So one of my experiments is I had the, the PDF of the of the final proof of the book, and I created a kind of ask Paul Nitza, and tried to kind of just to see whether it would tell me like things based on. And I tuned it a little bit, you know, just to kind of say it in Paul Nitza's voice. But it did a pretty good job of sort of telling me what I wrote about Paul Nitza, you know, in the perspective from the perspective of his own voice. So I don't know whether that's good or bad. Well, now the unveil, we've actually been interviewing a chat GPT <laughs> model this whole, yeah. this whole time. There, but there are, there are such things yeah. now. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. So no, I, I am, I am really he, uh, yeah. And I'm happy to talk about what I'm thinking about in terms of a next book project. Yeah, let's wrap, let's yeah, wrap I mean, with that. We can wrap it with this. So I, again, when I said earlier about how I got some interest in Paul Nissen in working on, on the Reagan and Gorbachev project, there, there is a, a passage in some of the NHTSA interviews that is stuck with me, and I'm thinking about how to kind of, you know, grapple with it over the next few years. 
And, and that just has to do with, with the role of mythology in um, mythology and history and mythology of particularly for sort of recent events. Mm-hmm. And Nitsa reflects on this a little bit in, in the late 1980s. And he sort of says, you, you can't just dismiss the mythology. And I can't remember exactly. I think it might be his talking about the Kennedy administration and, you know, the myth sort of established myths of, 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 of Kennedy and his brother. Um, but I, I think a lot about sort of some of the mythology surrounding the end of the cold war, the last 10 years of the cold war. Um, there, there are certain things I sort of, how do you, if you're going to, how do you define a myth um, versus sort of what we now say you hear misinformation, disinformation, revisionism, all those things you've got to like piece out in your own or sort out in your own head. What is a myth and what is an outright falsehood? But I do think sort of how do you connect mythology to um, history and policy? I, I think it's, it's worth exploring. Um, there may be people watching or hearing this who have done precisely that. And I've not read their book. I'm sorry. You know, I apologize for that, but I, I, I think we should kind of lean into it, the, the idea of, of, of mythology, because I, I, think, I think it's really important, not, not just about, you know, our more distant past, uh, but, but especially in, in terms of the 1980s and, and in terms of now we're at the point where I think in the, in the next 10 years, a lot of people working on policy um, sort of will not have we're still at the point now where a lot of people at the highest levels could have have a particular memory from the 1990s who were in government at some level. I mean, Tony Blinken, the secretary of state was a, you know, was an intern uh, as a Derek Chalet in uh, the defense department um, at the department of state. And you're going to, we'll reach a point where I think people, you, I mean, and, and if you start at a lower level and you see things a certain way, I mean, Blinken wrote about the um, wrote about the Reagan administration, the Siberian pipeline. That was his, you know, his first project. And you, and I, I don't mean that to sort of judge judge it one way or the other. It's just to say that you sort of, I think that people who rise to cabinet level positions, they kind of they come to DC and they have a certain view of things uh, at the time, and that that kind of sticks with them. But it, but at a certain point in the next ten years, we're going to people will not have met, will be in those positions without a clear memory of 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 the end of the cold war. And, and that's where I think it's important to kind of, you know, in a constructive way, um, just piece together, you know, what, what is myth, what is documentary record? What are things that, you know, there's just different interpretations for it, right? It's not just to say one thing or the other is not outright disinformation or misinformation. Well, James, thanks again for, for joining us today on the podcast. And once again, to our listeners, that book is America's cold warrior, Paul Nitsa and National Security from Roosevelt to Reagan. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Anthony. Rendezvous with History is a podcast produced by the Ronald Reagan Institute Scholarly Initiatives. You can learn more at ronaldreaganinstitute.org and follow along on social media at Reagan Institute.